meaningful investing, investing based on values and faith in addition to traditional metrics. You can invest in companies that will allow you to do well as an investor, but also can do some good for the world. But regulators say they may not be all they claim to be. Our sustainable investments benefit you and parts of the world that need it most. Destabilized me and confused me. It's a complete fraud. There's a high demand for sustainable finance and a healthy dose of skepticism too. Impact washing. Impact washing comes from the idea of greenwashing. 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 Where impact is neither sustainable nor beneficial. As the impact investing movement grew, it grew off the back of people just wanting to see their values in their portfolio, to see ways that they could use their money to make a difference. And that leads to the importance of impact integrity. It becomes really useful from a marketing perspective to be able to say, hey, we're an impact investment, or hey, we're a faith-driven investment. If we're claiming uh, that faith-driven investments are or are not investing in certain things, or they are having particular types of impact, we need to be able to back that up. That to me is really important that we maintain the credibility of what we're doing here in faith-driven investing. So I grew up in Papua New Guinea on the mission field and it gave me a heart for, for people who live in different uh, situations around the world. Uh, when I went to college, I knew that I wanted to do something with numbers. Uh, it was where I felt God had skilled me, uh, graduated and started working in the pensions industry in Australia, uh, doing consulting work um, for corporate pension plans as they uh, worked out how to maintain their funding levels and how to invest um, in a way that would help them to meet their objectives over time. I loved that work. I loved the technical nature of it. It, it was fun, it was neat to play around with, but it, it lacked purpose. And so through a, a sequence of events that was clearly God-driven, I ended up working with a Christian pension fund in Australia, wrestling with the question of how do we integrate faith into investment portfolios. And so I spent 15 years at that question. What does it mean for a Christian pension fund to be faithful on behalf of its 30,000 beneficiaries, delivering excellent investment returns and aligning portfolios with values? Today, I work with Brightlight. I've relocated my family from Sydney, Australia, to Denver, Colorado, to work with investors here in the US and around the world on this question of how do we get deep faith integration in portfolios. Uh, and that means we work with all kinds of groups, investment advisors, uh, investment managers, family offices, donor advised funds, charitable foundations, and all kinds of people who just need help taking that next step in integrating their faith in their portfolio. That might be a model portfolio that advisors can use with clients that integrates faith. Uh, it might be research on faith-driven investment opportunities in private markets with a deep spiritual and social impact intentionality. Uh, it might be supporting with screening of public companies to remove companies that are misaligned with a client's values uh, or to speak with companies to engage with them to influence for positive change. Wherever it is that an investor is stuck, we help them take that next step. We produce really simple fact sheets that help investors to understand the different types of faith-based options available to them in different asset classes, geographies, sectors, and using different structures. We then take that research into more detailed analysis pieces that help an investor to understand not just what is this product, but what are the strengths, weaknesses, risks, and benefits of using this particular product. And we do deep dive research reports that help uh, investment committees to make confident decisions to allocate to faith-based and impact-oriented strategies. We supplement all of that with a bunch of research on the faith-driven investment market to help investors engage with confidence to understand what is existing today and where things are going. Um, and we help with things like constructing diversified portfolios, uh, looking at public equities products to deepen faith alignment uh, and all kinds of other things. The, the work that we do touches public and private markets. It touches equity and credit. Uh, it touches clients from smaller amounts all the way up to hundreds of millions of dollars um, and just helps them to take that next step in aligning faith in portfolios. What I love about Tim is, is that in this movement of people that are wired to take that next step and blaze that next trail, he's coming behind with this intentionality of saying, 
as the movement goes wider, how do we take it deeper? How do we widen the road, pave it, making it more accessible for others to understand what's happening and to understand what should we be looking for? What should we be avoiding the next time we travel down that road? Let's talk about the depth of the market. Consider as an example, the market for public equities here in the United States. And let's look at the component that's invested through mutual funds and ETFs managed by faith-based fund managers. The market has gone from 6.7 billion in 1999 to over $50 billion. In 3.5 years, it has doubled. The number of products available has gone from 22 to 155, with 29 new products launched in the last two years. These are strategies available to everyday investors, reflecting a broad range of faith integration approaches and investment philosophies, active and passive, in the US and global, large cap and small cap, growth, core and value. The broader US-based mutual fund and ETF market for faith-based investors is over $90 billion. And that doesn't even begin to measure the scale of assets held in separately managed accounts, in private market investments, or from investors outside of the US. For more detail, you might want to look at Brightlight's research paper, The State of Play for Faith-Based Investing in Public Markets, which we're hoping to expand over coming years to show the true scale of faith-based investing. I, I think as a faith-driven investing movement, we're at, at, the, at the cusp, at the beginning of really rapid growth. We've seen a lot of the hard groundwork we've be done. Uh, we've seen credible strategies, uh, and we're starting to see capital flowing into the movement. So part of what's needed in the realm of faith-driven investing is actually uh, a codex or some way to interpret and make sense out of a lot of data, a lot of numbers, maybe a lot of qualitative reports. And so one of the things that Tim has been in the middle of helping to create is a balanced scorecard of how do we evaluate, not just on kind of the business metrics, can this fund perform, but also what have they said that they are focused on doing beyond just the quantitative metrics that all other secular asset managers are focused on and how do I actually uh, build a, a scorecard that has these qualitative values metrics, right, that are bespoke for each asset manager. So it's not about trying to dictate what an asset manager should be focused on. It's more saying, hey, what's important to you as the asset manager? And then how do I help hold you accountable to the things that you've said are important to you? To me, it's, it's about asking God, where do you want me and what do you want me doing? It's also about having the intentionality to stay, stay mission focused, to, to remember that we're about what God's doing, not about building the bright light empire or growing our business, even though those are important things. The, the people working in this space need to grow sustainable businesses that helps the movement to grow. But it's about coming back to asking God, who do you want me to work with? Where do you want me to focus? How do you want me to steward my influence well? So I'm a huge fan of J.R. Tolkien. Uh, and one of the things that uh, makes that Lord of the Rings trilogy so special is that uh, the author uses unlikely characters to actually be at the center of the mission. These are not the people that you would expect to be leading the charge or doing the work, right? This is Bilbo, this is Frodo, this is his friend Sam. And um, what I love about Tim, the son of missionaries, right, who when you first meet Tim, he's probably not the epicenter of what you would think in terms of asset management, river guide. Um, but he has a humility to him and he has a quiet uh, focus on serving his clients and serving the broader mission uh, in a way that is you know, rarely seen over the last 12 years. And so I love his humility. I love his, um, I love his perseverance. Uh, I love the way he listens well and engages with clients where they are, and we need more of that.